Okay. Okay, guys. So let's talk some credit reports. So you know, when we run a more when we do a mortgage, we are going to run everybody's credit. We have to run their credit. And so these are some of the basics here. Just give me one other second to get one of my other windows here set up. Forgive me. Okay. Okay, very good. So, so these are, um, so there's many different types of FICO, FICO scores, right? What happens is, is, so remember, we have to pull their credit because we need to pull in, we need to see what their credit scores are. Um, and they may think <clears throat> their credit score is, is one thing, but we find out that it's actually something different than what they think. The reason, or the reason for this is that is that there are many different uh, FICO models, right? So when you buy a home versus an auto loan or consumer credit, it's going to have the highest uh, rate of risk, and so it's going to have the lowest credit score. So, sorry, folks are still joining us here. So basically, what happens is is that like the um, the consumer credit is usually the credit score that they have access to. It's what happens when they pull their credit karma. Uh, by the way, uh, if you guys want a copy of this, you can totally have a copy of this, the, all of these slides if you want. Um, I will put my email in here again. You, all you gotta do is email me at the end of this and I will reply to your email with a PDF of this. So I know what it's like to sit through these classes and then you know try to take notes the whole time. You can totally have a copy of all of this. So there's no pressure to, to try to write all this down, okay? So basically what happens here is that um, the, the consumer credit is gonna require, this like the lowest level of risk. You know, we're talking like credit cards, um, maybe if they go get furniture, uh, you know, if they're gonna go get a car, there's gonna be a higher level of risk. Therefore, they're gonna pull uh, a lower credit score, right? It's good. They're pulling a different FICO um, on auto loans than we're pulling. And then when we pull a mortgage FICO, we are going to get the lowest credit score of all of them because there's the highest level of risk when buying a house. So if a person tells you that they think that they have like a 600 credit score and that they discovered that by running their credit karma, uh, it's very possible that when I pull their credit, it's gonna be a 580 or a 570 or something like that. There is going to be a difference between those numbers. Sometimes 10, 15, 20 points. It, it really just depends person to person. Um, and it, it's hard to predict what that difference is going to be, but I can tell you that there is definitely going to be a, a difference in those two numbers. Okay. So something to take into consideration when a person is telling you what their credit, their credit score is. So the scores range from 300 to 850, 850 being the highest. Anybody who has over an 800 is doing really well. Um, high sevens are doing pretty well too. If they're below the seven, if they're in the sixes, they're going to be getting there at that point. They're going to be, it's, they don't have the best, best score. We want to try to get an idea as to what the reason is, especially if in the low sixes or in the fives, there are some challenges there. There's probably some, um, you know, some collections or some other things that are just going to, to, to keep their score down, right? Um, so when we run all three scores, we're going to have to use the middle score, right? We're going to use the middle score. If we only pull two, we have to use the lower of the two. Um, but if we're only pulling two, it's possible that one of them is frozen. And then we have to do a little research and then get that unfrozen and then have that added on. Right? Um, so it's possible if we're only pulling two bureaus that one, like their name may be incorrect. So what I mean by that is that, you know, we have Equifax, TransUnion, and um, um, what's the other one again? Oh my God, it just escapes me. And here we are talking about credit reports. Anyway, so it's possible that one of them has, uh, uh, has one name and then the other one has a different spelling of the name. That does happen. Experian, thank you, Emissary. So, uh, so it's possible that they have, um, you know, it's possible that they, all three credit bureaus don't have the same spelling of the name, in which case we have to correct that and then have that added on. Okay? We don't always have to repull uh, the credit, the company that we use, Credit Plus, will help us sort that part out. Um, so 
something to take into consideration is not every place where they get their where they you know get a line of credit is going to really report to all the bureaus. So let's say they go get furniture. That furniture, that outlet where they report that, may only go to TransUnion and Experian. So they may not actually have all of these things on all of their, all, not every trade line may report through each credit bureau. Um, and if they have very little credit, two bureaus might work depending on how it all works. So these, this is an older presentation. And the only thing that's different is actually, forgive me, this VA is actually 600, uh, let me write that down. Change that for when I print this out for you guys. So VA is actually 600 right now. FHA is 600. These are minimum credit scores. Conventional is 620. USDA, 640. All right. We have a whole class on USDA and how those work. They're going to want a lower level of risk USDA than FHA. Conventional, kind of a middle of the road level of risk they're willing to take. So this is what makes up a credit report. So it's payment history. It's the amount owed on the credit cards. And you'll notice that these two together are the bulk of what the credit score is made up of. And the rest of it's a little bit less, right? So you have the credit mix, the different types of credit is going to be 15%. Uh, new credit is going to be 10%. And the length of the credit history is another 10%. So let's just focus on these two because these are the ones that have the largest impact on a credit score for sure. So, man, there is there is such a huge amount of misinformation in the marketplace for what what how a credit credit score is built. If, if I had a dollar for everybody that told me that they were told that by paying interest, they can build their credit score. And that is not exactly true. So what happens here is that when they run up their cards, let's say they have a, a, a max out of $1,000. If they are above $501, they're above 50%. The bureaus view that as a maxed out credit card. And so the more money they have out on a card, the lower their score is going to go. So we try to tell them, use your card one time, pay it off to zero, and do that. You know, Use it once a month so you have an active trade line and pay it to zero because we'll get to that in a little while because all that all those all that money they pay toward those those credit cards is going to eat away at their debt to income ratio. So payment history is also a really important feature here because this is the way this works. Um, so let's say a borrower uh, opened up a card in in January and they've been using it and making on-time payments the whole time um, and now, They've been making their on-time payments all the way through the whole year. And then all of a sudden, December, you know, they've, they've made 11 on-time payments in a row. What's been happening is, is that they have been getting a little bit of credit for each one of those months that they've paid their card on time. And the minute that they pay that late in December, they have lost all of the benefit that they have just accumulated in the previous 11 months. And so late payments are can be really damaging to a credit score. So it's really important that, that people understand that by paying their cards on time consistently is one of the easiest ways to build, to build their credit. You know? And by paying it on time and keeping the balances low, they can increase their credit score and put themselves in a, in a better position to qualify. You know? you guys have any questions on this so far? You can unmute yourselves and just ask questions if you want. That's fine. Or you can type in a chat box if you want. That's fine too. So anyway, so let's talk about what a trade line is and we'll get to what that looks like. So a trade line is an entry by a credit grantor into a client's credit history and continued by a credit reporting agency. So one second, looking at your question here, Lauren. So if we do use a bank to check your credit score, that is not what we will be using for mortgages. That is correct, Laura. Uh, excuse me, Lauren. We are not going to be using that to, to, to do that. I don't know which one they're pulling. They're possibly, they're probably pulling their consumer credit and it might just be a soft pull. It might actually be a full pull. So, so a trade line is when a person 
goes into an agreement with a company like uh, you know Visa or something, and they say, okay, Visa, um, Visa says, okay, we're going to give you a thousand dollars, and the person makes an agreement that okay, I'm going to take money out on this line of credit, and I promise to pay you back. And then what happens is, is Visa will report that to the, um, you know, the th the three uh, credit bureaus, and let the world know how they've been behaving with within this agreement that they've made ultimately, you know, um, and so. A line of credit defines the status and activity of the consumer's account, and that information includes when the when the opening date was, the credit limits, the type of account, the balances, and the payment histories. And this is what that looks like. This is one trade line when we see it. Let's go what over what we have here. This is a C because this is for a co-borrower. Um, this was the secondary person on the, on, the, on the account. If it's the borrower, it would just have a B here. This has been reported to Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. This is the name of the, uh, uh, you know, of the creditor. It's probably Sync or any bank. Um, we do get some of their numbers. I have to black them out here. Um, so this is a uh, revolving credit. So this is when it was reported last. It was opened in 2013. This was reported from 2016. This is probably when I built this, uh, this presentation. This is the, the, uh, the max out limit is 360. They have a balance of 273. So they're above that 50%, right? And what's happening here is they also have a late payment just you know in the last year here. Um, what happens here is that this payment is really important because this is what we're going to use when because a borrower is going to have a bunch of these right. Uh, and then we're going to pull all of these payments in and they are going to chip away at the debt to income ratio. Um, so emissary the when a borrower has no credit, what is the preferred amount of credit card that the client should open. So they're going to need to have at least more than one card and they're going to have to have active, they're going to have to have them active for six to 12 months, probably more closer to like 12 months. If they have no credit at all, think of it this way. If they have no credit, when we pull it, they're going to, they're not even going to have a score at that point, you know, if they have absolutely no credit. So we'll pull, we've pulled them many times. We've gotten three, three pull, you know, uh, you know, all three credit bureaus have pulled back, have responded and there's no, scores on any of them they're just blank you know and we can see that it's pulling we can see that they just have no credit history at all so in having no credit history is a no-no if they can use a mortgage for sure because we're going to need something to prove to us that the agreements that they've made to pay back their bills are actually sound you know so remember uh, let's talk about something else here this is something that they brought on maybe i don't know four years ago or so that didn't always the bottom part of this did not always look like this what used to happen was, is um, it would show what the balances were. And, you know, we can see what the balances are. And if we saw, you know, three or four trade lines that had like a limit and the balances were, were close to what the limit was, they could do a, we could do a rescoring. The buyer can pay off all their credit cards and they would get a boost in their credit score. So <clears throat> what they've done is they have actually now reported back for 24 months, as you can see here to here. And we can see what their actual rolling balances were all the way back the whole time. And this person has basically been running a, a, a 50 a plus 50 percent balance for the entire time. So this is what their history looks like. So if they were to pay this down, they're not going to get as much of a boost as they used to. OK, so they've they've changed this in a way, you know. Um, because they want to find out, they want it to be really, they want a really strong example of exactly how responsible is a person behaving with these agreements, with these cards that they they have out there. And as you can see, um, when they have these scheduled payments that come in, um, these are going to be, these are going to change depending on the balance. So the higher the balance, the higher the monthly payment that they have to make. So so they're paying, okay, thank you, Lauren. We're gonna to get to that right now, actually. So what happens is if they pay this off to zero on a monthly ba basis, this turns to zero, which is exactly what we want. On the mortgage side, if they have a zero here, what happens is, is remember a buyer is gonna come with a limited amount of income. They're gonna bring a limited amount of income to the table. So if they only have you know $3,200 a month in income and we start adding up 35 on one card, 
25 on another, 45 on another, um, you know, that's going to start to chip away at the amount of money that they can pay toward a mortgage payment. Um, so what ends up happening here is uh, if we can get these all to zero, um, we can have more money to go toward a mortgage payment. And keep in mind, we can actually pay this off at closing, if, especially if we don't really need this to boost the credit score. And what we really need is this to open up their debt to income ratio. They can just pay this right here at closing. They could pay a car off at closing. We've seen them do it numerous, numerous times, but they just pay a car off at closing and three credit cards because they have the cash. Maybe they're selling a house and they have proceeds from that sale and they can just remove all of these trade lines. You know, they don't, they don't get removed, but the balances get removed and the payments get removed. So Soul Angel, the joint accounts can affect their credit score. Yes, they can, for sure. Especially if they co-sign for another person's house or a car, 100% that those do, those very much will, um, they're held to those, they've agreed to those to those debts. So they're, they're obligated to pay them. Um, now, you know, if it's on a car or something and it's, they, you know, co-sign a car for a child or something, they can, the child can refinance the parent off to open up that trade line. Um, if a child, if they co-sign for a mortgage and a parent uh, and the child has 12 months of payment, 12 months of payment history, we can remove that mortgage from their trade line. Not, we don't remove the trade line, but we remove that liability on our end when we build their debt to income ratio. So there's a lot happening here. And if they start paying them late, these start to accumulate and down goes their score. It starts to decrease at that point, you know? So, okay, anybody have any other questions on, on what we're looking at here? We're gonna move on to some more other, other parts of things that we're looking at. But okay, so. So <clears throat> collections are one of the things that can definitely damage a credit report for sure. So what happens is, is that a, what a collection account is, is any unpaid credit, right? So the, the buyer uh, has gone into an agreement with a creditor and they've said to the creditor, okay, um, you know, we're going to give you a cell phone and they say, okay, great. I'll pay you a hundred bucks a month. Plus, you know, the other 50 bucks to pay for the phone and they stop paying and they have backed away from the agreement that they have, that they have entered into. And so now Verizon is going to say, well, I want my money and I'm going to take you from an active trade line to a, you know, it's active. So, but we're going to now go to collections with this. And they report to the credit bureaus that they have not paid their bill. They have an outstanding balance of $590 or whatever their balance is. And we end up seeing what that looks like. I got a slide in a couple of, a little bit, but uh, what those look like. And these are considered what's called derogatory credit, right? And this could be on anything. It could be medical, auto loans, credit cards, right? Public services like, you know, water or electric, cell phone bills, rents to apartments, student loans are really popular because they go deferred. And then some people don't know they've come out of deferred and haven't paid them. But any, any creditor that can really, can really add one of these on here. Um, so, okay. One second. <clears throat> yes, Lauren, those two as well. Attorney's fees, small claims courts. For, if a, like if, a, if, a, if somebody is not paying alimony or child support, 100%, that's going to be in here. Um, and if that would be considered like a federal level, like a, like a county lien or something, we cannot close with that in place. Um, those are, those are big time. They have to resolve that debt or put themselves on a payment plan or something. We cannot close if they have not been paying their child support. Um, so medical, let's talk about medical. This is sort of a slippery slope here. So the medicals are not going to be held. They're not going to be held to paying those off. So they don't have to pay off their medical debt, but the medical debt, if they have enough of it, is going to decrease their credit score. So as, as it's not going to prevent us from closing, it's going to, it could bring their score so low that they just don't qualify anymore for sure. You know, so, um, so like, let's say they have four or five medical collections because, you know, those come from a lot of different places. You know, when you go to a hospital, you get a hospital bill, you get a doctor bill and, you know, how this is going to go to the hospital. It can get really complicated about how you're actually paying for your services there. And if you have like four of these and then two credit cards and maybe you didn't, maybe you got a cell phone company coming after them or something like that, it can, it can really damage them at that point. Um, because, you know, 
it's going to look like it's not just the companies that do this. You know, there's disputes as well. Also, when they start to dispute, and if we see like seven, eight disputes, and an underwriter gets their hands on it and looks at it, they're going to assume that it's the buyer and it's not all of these companies that made a mistake. It's unlikely that the hospital and two credit card companies and a cell phone company made a mistake, and now that it's all of their fault and not the buyer, right? Um, but disputes will keep their score higher because it's it's unresolved. But once it gets resolved, and if we find out that it is actually the buyer's responsibility to pay, their score will decrease. Because when we have too many disputes, we, we can't close either. They have to have under 2,000. Yep. So that could happen, emissary, for sure. It could just be, there's a lot of mistakes that happen in the medical world. And a lot of times you can resolve these things with the collection accounts. We've seen a lot of times they'll take off 30% right off the top if you're willing to pay them that day. And then, you know, it'll it'll look like as if it's resolved, your score will increase. So, so public record must be paid or restructured, right? If they have a bankruptcy um, or if they have a tax lien, um, any civil trial satisfaction, like we were talking about, you know, somebody else coming in. So if they have a bankruptcy, there is, you know, there are minimum thresholds on that. I think I have a slide in here showing what those are. Um, because they, they have to wait for the, the period of time and they're different FHA or conventional VA, USDA, they all have different thresholds on all of these, especially if it's a chapter seven versus 13. If I don't have a slide, which I probably do, um, I can send that to you if you guys want it when I send you a copy of this. It's a flyer and it's a lot of info. That's why I may or may not have added it in here. Um, so remember, all of this needs to be resolved by the end, by, before we're able to close. And that could be, again, it could be anything from tax liens, federal tax liens, uh, not paying their child support, not paying alimony, um, all kinds of things pop up on credit reports on these types of things. So something to keep us taken into consideration. So for FHA rules, they state that the, the total balance of the collections can not exceed $2,000, excluding medical. And because the medical will not prevent a buyer from qualifying for a loan, right? But if they have just a couple of collections and they're all cumulatively under 2000, excluding medical, we're basically good. As long as they didn't bring the score down so far where they don't qualify. So the medical collections, they do not prevent us from closing on a loan. However, they will affect the credit score. And in some cases can decrease the score so low, it will disqualify the borrower. All right. So let's get an idea of what a collection looks like. This is what a collection looks like. So remember, we're going back in history here. We can see that the collection was opened in 315, and this is how long the rolling balance has been going. It's, it's continued. The borrower hasn't, hasn't paid this. Um, this is on the borrower. It is only uh, being sourced through Equifax. And <clears throat> it is open, so this has not been resolved. It is a collection account here. And we can see that their past due is uh, 10, 12, and that they have a payment that they are required to make. And we have to hold them to this at this point. So that this may have been structured where there's a payment. Sometimes the payment is the whole past due. Um, so we don't have to, like, I probably could have included more than one of these, but if the payment is the same exact as the past due, we don't really have to include that. Right, because <clears throat> that's remember if they're under two thousand, it's not that big a deal. But if they have a, a structured repayment plan, we will have to do that because we know that's something that they're obligated to pay. So that will be added into their debt to income ratio. So when it comes to student loans, student loans are one of the main things that can prevent people from from qualifying sometimes. Um, and what I mean by that is it. it so think of it this way. Maybe younger folks uh, that just got out of college, right? Um, you know, I was trying to do a loan for, for somebody a couple of weeks ago, and she was a young lady. She's a teacher. She just got out of college. Um, so she's got a, a bunch of student debt. She's got a car payment. She's got multiple credit cards that we have to take into consideration. And 
once we added all of that up, she didn't really qualify for much. She had qualified for only like 120,000. And she says to me, you know, oh, she goes, she was so disappointed, you know? And she's like, well, what do I, what can I buy for 120,000? And I'm like, I'm not really sure. Like, I'm not, that's not my end of it. My only, my end is to try, you know, get you the money. It's up to you and the realtor to see if the market is going to provide to you something that's satisfactory to you within your budget. And so we have to try to get creative at that point. You know, we got to ask her, you know, you know, do you have a, a parent or something that's willing to come on the loan and help you co-sign um, or, or something? Because it was basically the student loan. She had so many student loans that her income didn't offset them enough to create enough space for a mortgage payment, if that makes sense. So um, if they are deferred, we need to include 1% of the loan balance of, the, of all of those student loans together. Okay, so if they owe, you know, $5,000, we got to take into consideration that they're going to be paying, you know, 50 bucks a month on that. Because um, we know eventually that is going to come where she does have to make payments on it. If we are using Freddie Mac, which is a secondary conventional loan, um, so I say, well, it's like, you know, it's another uh, type, it's this, you know, it's Freddie Mac, uh, it's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So it's basically a conventional loan. They will allow us to use a half a percentage point if they qualify for Freddie Mac. Okay. So this is what student loans look like when they're in default. We can see what the, the total balance is. And we can see that it is not requiring a payment at this time, right? And this is also what child support looks like. And so um, they are reportees for the borrower. They are, um, you know, reporting to all three, all three credit bureaus. This is an educational loan. This is... Um, so basically, we have to take this into consideration for sure. When we see child support, we know that's a red flag and we're gonna have to ask them to start to begin to resolve this. This is a collection, this is a student loan in collections, okay? So what very possibly could have happened was that this came out of being deferred and now required payments, borrower didn't know that and didn't make any payments. That's possible as of what happened. Um, that is a, a common thing because, you know, it's sort of something happening in the background. They know in the back of their head they're going to have to start to pay for these student loans at some point, but it's often some vague distant future that they don't really have to pay much attention to. And then all of a sudden they get to a place where, you know, 36 months has elapsed or whatever much time it was deferred for. And now, you know, now it's time to give them, begin making payments and they just didn't notice or didn't open their mail or I don't know what, you know, this happens more frequently than you would think. So, okay. So basically these are the, uh, the mandatory waiting periods for, um, for the, uh, for derogatory credit, right? So if they've had a chapter seven bankruptcy or chapter 13, those do get looked differently, looked at differently, uh, especially with conventional and VA. Um, if they have multiple bankruptcies that does get viewed differently altogether. If they have had a foreclosure, um, you know, seven years, two years, three years. Uh, so you can see it's all different based on loan product. Uh, so again, remember guys, you don't need to write any of this down. You're gonna get a copy of this here. Um, or if they had a short sale or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Um, so hang on one second. So emissary, a rehab program. So one way or the other, they're going to have to restructure that. They're going to have to restructure this a hundred percent. Just hang on one second, guys. Guys, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you wouldn't mind just emailing me, because once I close out of this presentation, uh, I'm going to lose your emails. So if you wouldn't mind just emailing me, uh, you know, today's presentation about credit reports, I'm, I'm happy to send this over to you guys. So you don't have to send me your email, just, just send me a quick email. Uh, you don't have to send me your email in the chat box, just send it to me, just email me something real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll reply with it. Um, so, but keep in mind, if they have any of these challenges here, they are going to have to wait for sure. These are all federal guidelines and we do not have any wiggle room on. And, you know, for things like a foreclosure, it's two years from the day that the bank took possession of the home. 
Um, not from not two years from the beginning of the process. The day the bank took the home is the day that those two years begin. Okay. So for chapter 13, with FHA, the buyer will need written permission from a bankruptcy court to get a mortgage if they're going to try to go ahead of time. Okay. So what ends up happening is, is we're going to be looking for compensating factors. We may end up into a manual underwrite. And we, there are some of these compensating factors are things we're going to use instead of what we already have. <clears throat> you know, so we may look for 12 months of on-time rental history, a larger down payment, reserves. You guys know, I'll tell you what reserves are. Reserves are when, let's say they have their cash to close is 10,000 and their monthly pay, mortgage payments 1,000, their PITI. Um, we would need to see 13,000 in the bank so that when they close, we see that there's 3,000 to accomplish that three months uh, of those next three mortgage payments. That's what reserves are. Or we want to see a consistent or strong work history, maybe one employer or, you know, you know, only one or two employers in the last couple of years. Okay. So we're going to see this at times as well when you have charge-offs or write-offs where um, this is something that went into, uh, it went into collection and this has just been written off. And basically we do not have to take this into consideration at that point, right? You know, cellular, right? They owe Claro you know, 170 bucks or 85 bucks for, you know, uh, and, you know whatever their, their telephone bill was. So late payments get viewed as in 30 plus, 60 plus and 90 plus days. And, like we said earlier, the history of these late payments or the history of their payments is the largest factor in the FICO score. And by continuing to pay their bills on time, small amount of credit is accumulated each month, but a single late payment will remove the whole accumulated benefit. So really, excuse me, really important that they make all of their payments on time uh, because we it can really damage them. So this is uh, as far as late payments go. So if they have late payments on a mortgage, it can really challenge their ability to get a mortgage here. So within, if we're going to use FHA and they've got late payments on their current mortgage in the house that they live in, they can have no more than three 30-day late payments or two 30 days and one 60-day or one 90-day late payment. So they can't have more than 90 plus days late, so to speak. And that would be broken up in any of these ways. 90 day, 190 day, 230 day, 160 or 330 days. Okay. So conventional has a different definition for, for late payments. Excessive prior mortgage delinquency is defined as any mortgage trade line that has one or more 60 to 90, 120 on 150 day delinquency reported within the last 12 months. Okay, so if they have anything over these numbers, then they're not going to qualify, right? When we see late payments on a mortgage, we start to get nervous. Now we have to really, really examine what's going on and, and what their payment history is on this. Because remember, they're trying to get another mortgage. And if their recent history shows that they are not currently paying their mortgage, they, uh, they may want some sort of compensating factors to compensate for this, whether that's larger down payment, you know, again, something else there or like buy at a lower debt to income ratio. Um, but if they have like a 610 credit score and they have all these late payments and they're trying to max out their debt to income ratio, we may have to make an adjustment to, to compensate for this. All right. So disputes, accounts for a total more than $1,000 must be resolved or the file gets downgraded to a manual underwrite. Medical bills are excluded. Remember, when we see a lot of disputes, we have to start doing math because we need to see all together how much all of those disputes are. And so remember, you know, if we see too many disputes, just the, the common sense approach to it is that, you know, if they've just disputed six or seven trade lines, it's probably unlikely that all, all of those different creditors had made a mistake. It's possible that it's the borrower that's, that's you know, just maybe doesn't want to pay their bills or I, I don't know what, you know, I'm speculating here, but you know, we see this from time to time. And keep in mind that those disputes are there and the, the credit scores is, is artificially high until that they are, until they're resolved. Because once they're resolved, we find out really if they have agreed to it 
uh, if we they've agreed to making a payment, then they're going to get viewed as if it were their it were their balance, you know. So when it comes to a rescoring, uh, we can adjust these trade lines for the borrowers. Gives us a quick change in the credit score. And some of the things we can change are credit card balances. We can reduce those balances. The accounts can be paid in full, just like an auto or a house loan. Um, we can remove disputes, do a bunch of different things. Some of these things are really easy for us to make a quick adjustment just so we can get them to qualify. Um, but, you know, keep in mind if it's something a little bit bigger than that, if it's something that's like, you know, if they've had their identity stolen or something like that, or they have some, some trade lines that aren't supposed to be there, that's not really something that we can do. We're going to push them to a credit repair company. Um, but I mean, we can remove disputes, but resolving those disputes is going to be a different different thing altogether, you know? Um, some of the easier, smaller stuff that we can look at really quickly and know that just a couple of adjustments can get them to a place where they can qualify a little bit easier or is, is easier for us. And it's 35 per agency, $10 per each credit line. And it takes seven to 10 business days. Buyer has to pay that out of pocket before we move forward, basically. So guys have any questions so far? I've got about 40 minutes in here. So guys, I do this little video every morning. Feel free to check this out. It's on your My Agent page. I also update these to YouTube. They're three to five minutes each. It's just something uh, to update you in the mortgage world and in the marketing world. I do most of the marketing on our team here. Um, like I said, I try to keep this tight and simple. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to give you something to, you know, something that's relevant to all of us in real estate. Again, all of those are backed up on my YouTube page. They are all also on your My Agent page. Um, I have an Instagram as well. It's my favorite uh, social network. This is where you can find me and follow me here on Instagram. If you follow me, I will follow you back and I'll give you some likes when I see your stuff pop up. I built a website here, my own two hands, super duper. It's called lilydemarie.com. Um, it's got some, uh, some things about loans, things that we do for realtors, uh, some of the resources as a list of the documentation that you guys need, things like that. Feel free to check that out. And here is my contact info, right? So um, this is my phone number, this is my email here, this is the website. If you want to have anybody apply online, they just be unionhomemortgage.com, ldmarie, uh, slash the ldmarie. That's Lily. We run everything through her name. So if you are not currently signed up for list reports, you definitely are missing out on a good thing. Uh, this is a service that Lily and I pay for that is free to you. Um, if you want, I can sign you up for this and I can sign you up for, um, we can sign you up for uh, the mortgage app. If you want, I will need your headshot. I'll need your KV core page, especially um, your Facebook, the name, you know, the, the way to get to your Facebook page, you know, your, you know, your name, your email, your, all your contact info, basically. And then I can get you signed up for that. I don't know, today or tomorrow or so. Um, unfortunately, Lauren, we do not, we are not licensed in Texas. Unfortunately, we are only licensed in Florida, but we'd love to help otherwise. Do uh, you guys have any questions so far on everything we've talked about? You can unmute yourselves if you want. You can type in the chat box if you want. Sure thing, guys, you're very welcome. So if you, uh, again, if you wanna email me, if you wanna just email me your headshot and your Facebook page and your KB Core page and all your info, I will get you signed up for that. I will um, send you all of the info you need. I will reply to that. Um, so there's a lot, Bianca, about the difference between our process and a, and a regular bank. Bank may only just do a pre-qualification where we are going to do a full pre-approval, which means we're going to do all of the, the documentation collecting up front. We're going to do a really uh, in-depth calculation on their income, and we're going to go through everything with a fine-tooth comb before we put them under contract. We're going to be as diligent as we can with, uh, with our efforts because we don't want to put them in a position where they can't close. I don't know if you've ever done a loan with a bank where you find out literally the day before closing that they don't actually qualify, um, but that is terrible for everybody involved, for you, the buyer, for the seller, 
for the uh, you know the selling agent, title company, insurance. Everybody who's done all that work up front has just found out because Bank of America didn't do all of their diligence on the on their income. You know. So Sheila, this reports is. Here, I'll show you something. This reports gives you marketing materials for all of your listings. Um, and so let's say you, it just automatically sends it to you, right? <clears throat> so basically, you know, you have a listing, it gives you a property website, which is like a, a landing page or a squeeze page. And this also is something you can, you know, push to Facebook. Um, you can run ads to it if you wanted to. It's got automated text follow-up. It's got uh, lead capture. Um, if you want to make open house flyers, um, we can just generate this really quickly here. It co-brands you, the realtor. Lily is always going to be the primary on those. Um, and then it pulls the, you know, the pictures from, from, the, uh, from the MLS, pulls a description, all the property details. Uh, and then it gives you these other little infographics and things like this about the neighborhood and stuff like that. If you want to pull just infographics, you can pull these here as well. And we think we've gone through more than one company. We think this has the best graphic design for sure. If you want to send snail mail, you can certainly do that. Here's a postcard you can have printed and then send out in the mail. Easy download link, send right to a printer. It's funny, I get these in the mail from other realtors sometimes just because I live in, you know, I live in celebration, so I get all kinds of mail for this. Um, they have sign riders as well. And even if you don't have a listing, what we can do is we can actually, like if you have somebody in your office that is going to allow you to do an open house, I can make a special flyer just for you for a, their property that has your name on it. So you have something to hand out at that property where you can say, look, I'm not the listing agent or whatever, but, but here's my contact info. And every time they look back at this house, they'll see you. Um, we think that's another really handy tool as well. But again, this is something that's free to you guys. Um, and we think that the automated follow-up and CRM that it comes with is, is really handy for sure. You know, you add this onto your MLS and your KB core and you give the buyer another option, um, another place to go for, you know, how to, you know, how to get in touch with you. So again, guys, the, my email is here. I'll put this in here again. Please don't send me your email address in the chat. Just send it, just email me right from here. Um, and so feel free to, you know, um, I don't know if, I don't know about Chris, uh, by the way. Clarissa, I don't know what he has happening for himself. So um, anyway, feel free to send me over your, uh, you know, your headshot, your KV core page and your Facebook, and I'll get you signed up either today or tomorrow. So, and if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to email me or text me guys. So thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate you spending a little bit of time guys. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And, um, look out for my Facebook ads seminar every Monday at one o'clock. And then next week I'll be back here at one o'clock again for, uh, I forget which class we're giving. It's on the uh, calendar and uh, it's on the La Rosa calendar. So anyway, thank you very much, guys. Good to see you all. Thank you.